Afternoon. Thank you for joining the inaugural From Paws to Claws Alumni Speaker Visionary 2020 series. We are in our fifth month, and if this is your first time joining us, welcome. If you're returning for another moment of hearing from our knowledgeable and engaging alumni panelists, welcome back. Your Office of Alumni Relations appreciates each of you. We will continue to bring remarkable alumni as information experts in their specific fields. They will expound on relevant topics. They will support our students, recent graduates, as well as alumni who are seeking career change and individuals who just wish to support the series. As always, we wish to thank the alumni panelists. We did not seek you out but yet you came running with the spirit of a mighty panther, which we are, sharing your knowledge base when the call to participate went forth. This is our newest series of From Paws to Claws, and we are still dedicating it to the Perfect Vision class of 2020 as they exercise their ability to be visionaries. Let me share a tad bit of history on the Office of Alumni Relations signature event. The Alumni Student Networking event, titled From Paws to Claws, was originally designed in 2008, when Kareem Taylor, class of 2010, in his sophomore year, expressed that students should be engaged and learn from alumni at our exceptional university. Over the years, we continuously call on the alumni community to embrace our alumni commonly known as students. We encircle them until they become a member of our alma mater. As Panther Cubs, they develop through discovery, academically, socially, and spiritually, finding their way as their paws grow claws and become fully entrenched felines of service, locally, nationally, and globally, while remembering to provide financial support to the institution that placed them on their paths as well-rounded citizens. There is more to the program and feel free to read the entire historical review in the alumni section on the CAU website. As we begin our conversation, I would like to express thanks to my colleague, Chastity B. Evans, class of 2010, who serves as a program manager in the Office of Alumni Relations. She will be your host, for she created this special space for interaction. Chastity, it is now time for you to begin our exchange. Thank you so much, alumna Galen E. Gatewood Joshua, for that treasured introduction and credible context. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining your Office of Alumni Relations for the Vision 2020 series. When you reach the top, Remember to send the elevator back down for others, part two. An exceptional thank you to alumna Dr. Michelle Rhodes, Program Specialist for the Office of Online Learning and Continuing Education for being the technical guru behind all of OER's webinars. To become a true leader, here is a phrase in the entrepreneurial world called paying it forward. The notion that all of us who have had some degree of success, likely had individuals give us that break. They believed in us when we had not yet earned such trust and from whom opportunities came that have helped create our success. The credo is simply this, when you get to the top of your ladder of success, help someone else pay it forward. Or when you get to the top floor, don't forget to send the elevator back down for someone else. Join us as we discuss one of the most important things to do in our careers, help others' dreams become a reality. It's a privilege and an obligation to support others in achieving their desired success. 
the newest arrivals will appreciate it and you'll leave the world better than you found it. Just a couple of housekeeping rules before we move forward. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. I will bring them up during our Q&A session to discuss. Now, without further ado, introducing our first panelist for this afternoon is alumna Sonia Natasha Brown. Alumna Brown serves as the Director of Community Affairs, Deputy Chief Assistant District Attorney with the Office of the DeKalb County District Attorney, Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit, where she oversees the office's community outreach efforts and the Crime Strategies and Community Partnerships Unit, known as CSCPU. As a member of the State Bar of Georgia, Alumna Brown is active in several local bar associations and served as the 2009 president of the Georgia Association of Black Women Attorneys and served a three-year term from 2017 to 2019 as the president of GABWA's philanthropic arm, the GABWA Foundation Incorporated. She serves her community through many different avenues, including as a supporter of the Covenant House of Georgia, where she has participated in their annual fundraiser, The Sleep Out, Executive Edition, which raises funds for an awareness about youth, um, youth homelessness. She also served as the chair of Covenant House Georgia fifth annual Sleep Out, Women Unite. Alumna Brown is also a proud member of the Tau Pi Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She founded Design for Destiny Ministries, a ministry created to inspire, encourage, and equip women to fulfill their destinies. Alumna Brown has also been recognized by numerous organizations, including being a recipient of GABWA's Bensonetta Tipton Lane Award for Commitment to the Family, the inaugural Judge Willie J. Lovett Humanitarian Award by Black Law Students Association, BLSA, at Atlanta's John Marshall Law School, and was previously named an Atlanta Johns Marshall Law School Distinguished Alumni. Also, super round of applause to alumna Brown, who was recently appointed as a full-time Cobb County Magistrate Judge. Judge Designate Brown will fill the vacancy created by Judge Kelly S. Hill's recent election to the Superior Court bench, affected by Chief Magistrate Judge Brandon F. Murphy on January 1st, 2021. Congratulations and thank you so much for joining your alma mater and for serving your alma mater today. How are you doing? I am doing very well. Thank you for having me and thank you for that very gracious, very gracious introduction. So thank you for having me just part. Glad to be here. No problem. And thank you for accepting the invitation to be a part of this panel today. We truly appreciate it. Thank you. So we're gonna dive into your first question for today. Okay. These suite executives and positions are highly coveted roles. Many people at various levels in their careers aspire to be executive leaders, whether now or some distant day in the future. Alumna Brown, do you or have, um, you have been in the C-suite for some time now. What abilities and qualities does one need to get there? What should we do to cultivate these qualities and show our employers, leadership teams, that we are up to task of joining their ranks? That is a wonderful question. I'm glad we get to kick it off um, with that. I think there's so many things that we as, whether we're young in our career or more seasoned in our career, can do from the beginning and continue to do. And so what I always encourage those, whether I'm mentoring them or someone that works on my team, is at first, I look at someone who shows initiative, someone who is a self starter, because you're not going to make it as an entrepreneur. Uh, we have some amazing entrepreneurs on this panel. You're not going to make it, you know, in the corporate America realm serving in a major uh, corporation, particularly um, like a uh, major sports team without showing the initiative, without being a self starter. Um, it also begins with education and education from two 
uh, worlds that I deem it. Your formal education, getting the certificates, getting the degrees in what it is that you want to do, but also making sure you're getting that real world education and that comes through experience. You know, um, particularly in the community I work in, in the public sector, we don't always have paid internships or paid externships. But we look at those law students who want to come in and they, and they say, you know what, I, I know you're not paying, but I want to be here because I want to learn. I want to know from the ground up what it is that I can do to succeed in this area. And they work and they work hard. And I think that coupled with becoming an expert in whatever the field it is, again, continuing to get educated, joining organizations perhaps in the profession, as well as joining, you know, getting trade magazines, attending conferences, attending symposiums, gathering the information from wherever you can get it. Pick up the phone and call somebody who is doing the job that you're doing. Um, you just announced that I was recently appointed as a judge. I started talking to judges in law school, finding out the path that they took. How did they get there? It's not an overnight thing. Nobody on this panel woke up this morning and decided that they wanted to be the person that they are to be successful. So the hard work, putting in the time. And what I always tell people is produce excellence 100% of the time. Your reputation is going to precede you. When you walk into the room, people have already done the soft references, right? I always tell people when you put a reference on a list, I'm going to call them, but I expect them to tell me wonderful things about you because you've asked them to serve as a reference. It's those soft references. Um, and I'll just put a little bit of point of privilege. I know that um, one of Miss Lee's line sisters is a very, very, very dear friend of mine, Lakeitha, Carlos, Lakeitha Daniels Carlos. And mm -hmm. so I know for a fact that people have called her about me or we've called other people. We've both been presidents of the Georgia Association of Black, Black Women Attorneys. She and I have talked about how People have called us because someone has listed our organization as a member. They want to know how hard does this person work? And your excellence, I may not work with you in that field, but I saw when you volunteered to, on that committee, did you put the hard work in? So that's how you cultivate the skills. Being a leader doesn't begin when you get a title. Being a leader begins when you decide to serve. And people are always, always watching you. And you never know who's watching you, who's going to tap you, you know, on, on the shoulder. And then voice your desire, you know, let them know in the organization, hey, I'm interested in this path. I'm interested in doing what you do. What's the way to get me, you know, along that path? And so I know it's a lot that I just said just now because there's so much. It's not just one thing, not one ability, not one way. And again, I just harp on that word excellence. Whatever you do, do it with and in and for excellence. In, with, and for excellence. I love that for today. And I definitely wrote it down because it's probably going to be on uh, one of my social media platforms today. <laughs> so we know that different times and different circumstances call for different leadership skills. And you kind of touched base on this in your prior question um, answer. When it comes to managing your own career as the um, current Director of Community Affairs and Deputy Chief Assistant for the Office of the District Attorney, Stone Mountain Judicial Circuit. How are you preparing yourself and your team for the move up, you know, for the come up in January? Because you know, we're super proud of you and we, I know your team is as well, so. Thank you, and they are. It's been a little bit sad over the past, past couple of weeks, but it's clear to note that this was not something that, I want people to know this was not something that I, started to seek in the midst of this. The, it, it, it was as a result, as you mentioned, because of the election of, of judge-designate Kelly Hill. And so the position did not even come about until this summer. But it also but, goes to what you were saying, though, you know, in terms of uh, people noticing you, people noticing right. how hard you work, you know. So you may not have sought out for it, but your excellence definitely crafted you to have thank you thank you and i believe i was prepared for it when the time came i had been preparing for this for my career right and so as i was i've been talking to our district attorney we haven't had many conversations she doesn't want to have the conversation yet but as we've been having the conversations we've been talking about who is it can take on this role and so I have been preparing my team members. When you come onto my team, I sit down, I ask you, 
in the interview why you want to be a member of this particular team, whether it's an internal or external interview. And then what are your goals? What are your goals within this organization? What are your goals outside? Because I want to empower my team to be excellent, to be great. And so the only way that I believe that when an opportunity comes for me is for me to have somebody else prepared to take the role. I'm not afraid of teaching my team what I do. You know, I'm not afraid that if I share the trade secrets that someone's going to stab me in the back and take it. Um, mm -hmm. Because I want to empower my team and let them know I'm on your side. If someone came to me and said, Sonia, I'm seeking this opportunity outside, it would hurt because I don't want them to leave. But I want them to be prepared to go into leadership roles. And so I empower my team. I provide opportunities for them to lead. They sometimes say that, that I voluntold them to do a lot of things. <laughs> and I do. I admit that I do. I say, hey, we have this you know, opportunity, we have this event, or we have this meeting that's going to be held with our commissioners or our police chiefs. I need you to go. And like, what am I supposed to talk about? These are the topics. This is what's going to happen. Put it together, then come back to my office so we can review because we need to stay on message. So we need to stay on message that we're delivering the message of the office. So now let's talk about it. And now you go and you represent the office. And I always tell them, if I didn't think you could do it, I wouldn't have you on this team. If I needed, if I was gonna do everything myself or I could do everything myself, then I'd be a one woman show. Yeah. And I recognize that I don't know everything. So I bring people on my team with the skill set, the talents and the gifts so we can supplement and support each other. And so that's what I try to do, send them to trainings. Um, you know, they're sitting in a, an online symposium today making sure that they're getting the skills that they need to do the job that we have asked them to do. Um, and I tell people, don't be afraid to grow and don't be afraid to allow your team members to grow and encourage them to lead and be leaders, both within your organization and out. I, you know, have them all sign up. You said, which one of these bar associations? You need to be office representative. We divide up the bar associations. And I said, well, you can't just, we're not just going to pay for you. You can't be a financial member. What committees are you on? How are you leading? And that prepares them to take, you know, the reins when the opportunity comes. You have to be prepared. I was a, a, a Girl Scout, a girl guide. I grew up in the Bahamas. We call them guides, equivalent of a scout. And our motto was be prepared, right? And so luck isn't what gets you there. It's preparation with opportunity. And you never know when the opportunity is going to arise. So mm -hmm. I tell people, keep your resume together. It's not that you're looking for another job, but if someone says, hey, Chastity, you're doing a great job. Can you shoot your resume over? And you're like, oh, I, I'm going to take two days. And they're like, I need it in an hour. <laughs> hey, I'm going to get to it and you can send it. And it's not that you're looking for the next job, but you're preparing yourself for the next opportunity. I love so that. that's what I try to do. I love that. And that is so awesome to have women in this field and in other industries that look like you and I that are definitely encouraging people to do that. So. That is very, very important that when we, um, I think uh, Dr. Rhodes and I were on a, a panel earlier this summer and we talked about that, that you have to be at the table yeah. to be a part of the conversation. You have to be at the table in order to open the door. Um, and even in, even in a, you know, system like the criminal justice system where people are like, oh, well, so many people that are coming through the criminal justice system look like you. How can you be there? Well, if I want to change it, I need to be a part of the system and I can speak up when there are things that I don't like or things that we know are wrong. And that's part of leadership, being able to find that voice and to speak up when you see things that are wrong or things that need to change. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alumna Brown. Thank you. Thank you. you gems today and the attendees that are listening listening i really hope that they are paying attention because you definitely have to be at the table i wholeheartedly yes. agree so, if you all have any questions for alumna brown please type them into the q a box in your zoom control panel now we will be sure to get to them during our q a session thank you again rockstar congratulations <laughs> introducing our next panelist for this afternoon is alumnus jarell butler who is all the way flying across, but you know, he's all over the world, but he still made time for his alma mater. We are so thankful for that. Alumnus Butler founded Millennial Financial Solutions in July of 2015 as an avenue to elevate young professionals and entrepreneurs on their journey to financial success. Growing up in New Orleans, Louisiana, 
Helping others become self is a common theme. The culture is predicted on this trait and naturally it is something that alumnus Butler adopted in life. Alumnus Butler has a passion for financial literacy and giving back the knowledge he wished he attained growing up is his way of helping others. After receiving a Bachelor's of Science in Finance from Southeastern Louisiana, alumnus Butler matriculated to Clark Atlanta University to pursue his MBA in finance. During his time in business school, he realized the disconnect between the former education taught in school versus real life tangible education that prepares people for life events. Financial literacy is not a school subject, but extremely vital to the well-being of, of every person. Millennial Financial Solutions provides you with the knowledge and the expertise you need to fill this gap while empowering you to pursue and accomplish your dreams. Alumnus Butler believes that sound financial management in your 20s and 30s is critical to achieving goals you set for the future. The millennial generation is a group that is largely ignored in the financial planning realm. Most financial planners have millennial asset requirements for clients, which are not ideal for the young professional in the beginning stages of accumulating assets. Millennial Financial Solutions aims to help solve this issue by offering an affordable monthly retainer fee, which is not based on a millennial asset requirement. So for student um, debt, to tax planning, to special milestones in life. Alumnus Butler wants to make sure that your hard earned dollars are utilized in the most effective way. So we might be talking after, um, after this um, webinar, just letting you know. <laughs> but welcome to the panel, Alumnus Butler. Thank you so much for serving your alma mater and for definitely uh, being present today. How are you doing? Doing quite well. Thank you for the gracious introduction. Uh, very, very excited to be uh, able to just, you know, be on, be on the panel and uh, you know, spread knowledge with my fellow uh, Clark Atlanta. Panthers. <laughs> well, great. We are happy to have you. So we're going to go into your first question for this afternoon. So to create a truly agile enterprise, as the article, The Agile C-Suite by Brian Consultants, Daryl K. Wrigley, uh, Sarah Elkin, Steve Barrett, and the mid-June to uh, July 2020 issue of Harvard Business Review points out, the top officers, most if not all of the C-Suite, must embrace Agile principles too. Agility, of course, isn't new. What's new is to see the C-Suite embracing it. How is the financial world embracing agile principles at this senior level, and especially in this new normal stage of life? Well, Chastity, I think that's a great question. Um, the first thing I, I would like to point out is, you know, before I actually started my own firm, I spent five years in corporate finance at Capital One in Washington, D.C. Um, and that was a really interesting experience because the goal there at Capital One was to really be considered the Google of banks, where they wanted to uh, instill a culture within the organization of being agile, being you know technology, you know tech forward, and uh, really you know creating a culture where. Um, people would one day maybe embrace the remote working, the virtual working, uh, being able to connect on different levels outside of in-person. So uh, it's very interesting to kind of see what's going on with the pandemic right now and that a lot of the, those particular things that I've talked about are being accelerated throughout various industries. Um, mm -hmm. For example, you know, when the pandemic hit, uh, the first thing that everybody started to gravitate to was Zoom uh, and, and to you know, really create an environment that was um, as close to normal as possible as it pertained to interacting with uh, fellow team members. So, uh, what, so what I've seen personally, um, you know, from running my organization to also uh, talking to other people who are still in um, some corporate finance positions is that um, this is going to be uh, the wave of, of the future in terms of allowing people to work in an agile way um, moving forward. Um, and I think what's going to be very, very important for any employee um, 
who is going to be entering uh, any type of corporate job, whether it's finance, whether it's marketing, whether it's legal, is that one, you become very, very comfortable in embracing technology. Um, also, two, uh, be, become very comfortable in time management, right? Um, and I think moving forward, depending on, you know, how quickly we can return to some sense of normalcy, right? In this new normal world, uh, it's going to be very, very important to learn how to communicate effectively um, without having to be in person, right? So that's utilizing, um, you know, uh, proper prop, proper protocol as it, as it pertains to email communication, um, you know, being able to uh, add value to your, to your team um, virtually. You know how you know how how can you uh, as an employee um, continue to uh, elevate your value to the company um, in a world where we're seeing a lot of automation? So um, I think that's going to be very very prevalent as um, the you know days and months continue to move forward because we're because we're seeing in all types of organizations. Um, you know how do we uh, continue to adjust? Um, to this new normal um, where, you know, C-suite executives are actually began to embrace the, uh, the thought of working remotely. And I really, to be honest with you, I really don't think that they are beginning to embrace it. I really think, I really feel like they have to embrace it, yeah. especially if they want to stay re uh, relevant, if they want to stay prevalent, mm -hmm. and if they want to remain valuable, they have to. So, you know, as a token, you know, I feel like the people that are following behind them, you know, those points that you just touched, that's something that they definitely have to pick up on to understand and definitely um, make it valuable in order for them to stand, you know, out when it comes to being a C-suiter, because it's, it's not like it was five years ago, you know, it's yeah. not even like it was 10 years, I mean, uh, last year, so... You know, yeah. those agile principles, you definitely have to understand and take them and make them yours in order to stand out in that world. Yes, absolutely. And, and you know, just to kind of add to that point real quickly, um, I think I think you hit it on the head when you mentioned that, hey, you know, it's, it's, it's also pressure on the corporations to be able to provide the opportunity for employees to work in an agile and remote environment moving forward because the more companies that are embracing this, right, they're going to be using that as a benefit um, for potential employees. Hey, we will, we will allow you to work, you know, 100% remote or 50% remote or we'll, you know, uh, set you up with the proper technology. So I think, you know, on, you know, on that flip side, corporations are really forced to embrace the thought of, of becoming a more agile uh, corporation uh, as we continue to kind of move forward. So I think the, pan the pandemic has accelerated a lot of that. Most definitely, most I wholeheartedly agree. So, um, and you kind of touched the nail on some of the, uh, on this next question. Um, how should young would-be executives share your ambitions with their current employer? You know, especially now that we're going through uh, this pandemic, this new normalcy, you know, these new uh, principles to stay and remain relevant, letting them know that they are interested and they are open to candidly discuss their personal goals for change within their workplace. So I know also um, Alumna Brown also kind of touched on this as well, but within your industry, what are some key pointers that they may need to look into in order to reach that level? Well, I think, first of all, I think employees in general are in a state of empowerment right now. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at, again, you know, being in, being in the pandemic and seeing the, the shifts in how people are beginning to work, right? Um, it's creating a lot of opportunities for people to really embrace, you know, what their true calling is, right? Um, for, some, for some people that, you know, turns out to be, um, you know, finding a role in a corporation that best suits their skill sets. For some people, it's building those skill sets up within a corporation to become an entrepreneur. 
Um, you know, I was more on, on that second track, right. Where I, you know, spent five years in corporate and realized, Hey, you know, I, like, I think I have a really versatile skill set to become an entrepreneur and, uh, fill a gap that I, that I see that people need. So Mm -hmm. on that note of being able to communicate this to employers, I think it's two important aspects that come to mind, right? Um, when we talk about being empowered to, uh, pursue your goals, that ties into a couple of things. The first one is job security, right? Uh, normally when employees feel more secure in their jobs, they're more inclined to be able to have those conversations on, hey, this is where I see my career path going within this company, right? Um, and then the second part of that is financial security. And honestly, a lot of people uh, don't feel as confident projecting out their career goals to their employees because they feel like they have to rely on that job income. Um, And they don't have enough, um, you know, whether it's emergency savings or enough financial security to be able to project those goals, right? So what I try to do with a lot of clients is say, hey, okay, let's let's like start from the base level. Let's create an emergency savings, say savings account of three to six months, right? Um, that allows you to say, hey, you know, if you for whatever reason are not empowered on your career path and you need to make a decision to go in a different direction, you are financially secure in making that decision in pursuing your goals. Um, and you know, and it, and it and it really kind of boils down to behavioral finance, right? Um, understanding one, what are our necessary, um, you know, financial needs that you know that really empower us to you know go to work each day, right? I think everybody's ideal scenario is to be at a job where they don't feel like it's a job, like they feel like they're chasing their passion. Um, so being in a financially stable situation typically allows employees and individuals to act on those career goals. Um, and I think we are in a place in society where, um, most corporations are willing to embrace, you know, employees pursuing those goals and, You know, so, you know, coupling that with making sure that the employee themselves are in a, are in a financially um, stable situation um, allows them to craft an exit strategy if that corporation isn't supporting where those clients want, where, I'm sorry, where those employees want to go eventually. So it's actually a lot of moving parts. Um, like I said, you know, kind of boils down to how do you feel you know, at your current job from a, from a, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm in a role where I'm secure and I can speak out perspective. And then two, where are you personally financially with your, with your family um, to feel empowered to make a career changing decision if need be? I mean, and that's something that we definitely have to look at now, you know, being in this pandemic and, you know, things are not how we, like them to be or not how they used to be but I think you know it's been like a blessing to an extent because it has allowed different people to be creative to be agile to you know do extra things that they weren't allowed to do prior to you know because they were always working you know that nine to five that clock now you know people can now actually say hey I actually have some time now to be able to be more creative, to actually show my employer that I am valuable to this team, that I am worthwhile, you know, that I am worthy. So thank you for that. And um, along along with securing the bag, as the younger generation says. (laughs) So thank you so much, alumnus Butler, uh, for those essential tips and um, materials. We truly appreciate them. If you all have any questions for Alumnus Butler, please type them into our Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now. We'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. So moving it forward to our next panelist this afternoon, who is alumna, Dr. Doretta Rhodes. Alumna Dr. Rhodes is the Senior Vice President and Head of Human Resources for the Atlanta Braves, where she supports the Major League 
minor league and battery property development in all areas of people capital initiatives. Previously, alumna Dr. Rose was the EVP slash Chief Human Resources Officer for YMCA of Metro Atlanta, the VP Human Resources at First Data, where she provided consultations on human capital and organizational development strategies for over 5,000 First Data colleagues within financial services and consumer and network solutions and vice president of human resources for Turner Bro Broadcasting Systems Incorporated where she supported global technology operations. Before joining Turner, alumna Dr. Rose held leadership roles with Ernest & Young, ADP, Homegrocer.com, and Young Brands. Currently, alumna Dr. Rose is a board of director member and membership engagement chair of Human Resource Leadership Forum, known as HRLF, member of Human Resource People and Strategy, known as HRPS, Board of Director Member of the 21st Leadership, Argyle Advisory Board, Hawks Atlanta Diversity and Inclusion Member, and past President of the Alumni Board of Family and Consumer Sciences at the University of Georgia. How are you doing today, Alumni Dr. Rose? It's a pleasure to see you today. Is she here? Good afternoon. How are you? I was still needed. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the fun fact about alumna Dr. Rose. She's also my mentor. So <laughs> <laughs> more from Chastity than she's learning from me. So I, I have to just admit that. So it, it, it's a part. It is a partnership. And I agree. I agree. So we're going to go ahead on to your first question for this afternoon because we know that you are in your winning stage with the Atlanta Braves, and we're going to kick butt tonight. So woo -woo. from examining hundreds of executive profiles developed over the past decade or so as the senior vice president of human resources for the Atlanta Braves and interviewing numerous top managers about the requirements for senior leaders past, present and future. Have you noticed any clear signals about how C-suite jobs are evolving and why? This is interesting. I think when you get to that level and I have to speak just what Judge Brown spoke to and what Jarrell spoke to, a lot of times it's not what's on the job description. First of all, it's, it's the fact that you do the work and people know that you do the work because a lot of times decisions about individuals going into a C-suite has nothing to do with the job description. It has to do with relationships that you've created. It has to do with thinking back on what those relationships were and continuing to have them. If I think about roles that I've had the opportunity to be blessed to walk into, it has been merely by the fact that I've kept the relationships and the mentors that I had before. And so it's funny, people come to me and say, oh, there's a job description. What you'll find is most C-suite jobs are not posted. It is typically a job that someone knows someone and they say, you know what? I've dealt with either Judge Brown or Stacey Lee or Darrell Butler in some type of way and I want you to talk to them. And so when there's this notion that it's a job description around how you get a job, you need to have already put the work in. And I think um, all of us being alumni of Clark Atlanta University knows exactly what that means because it is about you make a way or you find one. And I think I have been blessed from the standpoint that even if someone said no to me today or said not now to me today, that does not mean that that's a no forever. So it is continuing to building those, building those relationships. It's continuing, as Judge Brown talked about, showing up with excellence with everything you do. It's funny when, I'm, when people reach out to me on my LinkedIn profile, I am very adamant about making sure I get back with them. I'm very adamant in making sure that even if I don't have this time today, I commit to you that I will have some time at some point in time because the reality for me is that I may not be in this job forever. We're rent, we are renting or leasing these positions that we have. And when we think of it that way and know that, that that can shift at any point in time, that we need to really be mindful about not only what we're doing now, what we're cultivating in relationships that we have, what do we wanna do for others? Because I know I can talk to you about a Dr. Kimbrough and what he said in entrepreneurship years ago, I won't, I won't date myself, although you have a date there. But anyway, I won't date in terms of that conversation that he would continually have with us. And that stays with me. 
Um, I remember getting highs in one of our um, finance cl classes and having to worry about that. The experience that I had at Clark Atlanta really prepared me for everything else that I was going to have to deal with in corporate and knowing what that looks like. And so I can't say to you, oh, there is a prescribed way that you get to the C-suite. What I would say is that there's a prescribed way for you to show up the same way every single time, and that needs to be showing up in excellence. That's true. Oh, man, I like that. Showing up in excellence. Y'all are just killing me. I follow Brown. Judge Brown was the one that started talking about excellence. I'm just building up on what she said. <laughs> so, so we're beginning to see C-level executives who have more in common with their executive peers than they do with the people and the functions they run. How important is it for members of senior management to not only support the CEO on business strategies, but also to offer their own insights and contribute to key decisions? In other words, understand how to operate their position as well. So my perspective on that is the way that you got into the position is operating in the position you have. So in most of the roles that I've had, if I'm leading the human resources function, most of the time my CFO or my CEO has, they have no idea about the work that I do. And oftentimes you need to bring it forward and always have that courage around, I'm coming to you because I have the functional expertise and this is what will support the organization. So I talk to people all the time around the fact that I have a business acumen with, the, with a specialty on people capital. So one of the things, I just bring it back at Clark Atlanta, I learned in my MBA program how to know about business. I learned how to look at a financial statement. I learned that the aspects and attendance of marketing. And I've been able to actually segue that into any conversation that I'm having with a business leader. The difference is that I decided to take a focus on people. I decided to focus on people capital and how that impacts the business. And the reason I personally did that is because if you look in most organizations, your highest expense are people. And if you're not thinking and knowing how to come to your CFO, your CEO, your chief marketing officer about that conversation, then you are doing a disservice. So I just kind of round that back to actually the question that you asked, which I asked you. You first need to know your function. That's the first thing you need to do. Because most often that got you into the door. And I love the fact um, around this conversation that we talk about having a seat at the table. That's your seat at the table, that you are functionally knowledgeable about what you know how to do. Now, oftentimes I've made the comment that although there may not be a seat, and I saw this amazing quote, then I'm going to find a folding chair and pull it up. So I'm <laughs> going to figure out a way that I'm able to assert myself because I know the knowledge that I have and what I'm bringing, that's what I've honed for the last 20 years. That's why I went back and, and got an MBA and went back and got my PhD and had the experiences that I've had so that I can sit down and have a conversation about things that you may not necessarily be able to speak to, but it impacts your business. And so that's been the important part for me. So not only do you do things, as Judge Brown say, says with excellence, but you need to perfect the craft that you have because that is what differentiates you with everything that you do. I agree. Oh my gosh. Y'all are giving me all of the taglines today. So if you follow Office of Alumni Relations, just know you will be quoted. <laughs> Thank you so much, alumna Dr. Rose, for your best practice as um, bright excuse me, best practices and for your awareness and intellect. We truly appreciate that. And we will be uh, reaching out to you for more information. So be on the lookout. If you all have any questions for alumna Dr. Rhodes, please type them into your Q&A box in your Zoom control panel now, and we'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you again, alumna Dr. Rhodes. I appreciate it. And good luck today. <laughs> Last but never least, introducing our final panelist for this afternoon is alumna Stacy Lee. Find a way or make one is not only the Clark Atlanta University motto, but it is one of the ways alumna Lee lives her life. And that's no doubt about it. 
she makes no excuses. A graduate of Clark Atlanta University and Georgia Institute of Technology, alumna Lee has earned a dual degree in mathematics and industrial engineering. An avid learner, alumna Lee returned to Clark Atlanta University where she earned an MBA with a concentration in marketing in 2008. Alumna Lee's belief in higher education and services to others is apparent by how she chooses to spend her time and energy. Alumna Lee's post-collegiate philanthropic endeavors include being crowned Miss Michigan USA 2004. Whoop, whoop. Alumna Lee used her platform to raise over $100,000 to aid in eradication of breast and ovarian cancers. Also in 2004, her and her brother Terry B. Lee honored their parents, Terry and Sandra, both Clark College alumni, by establishing a scholarship in their name. They have awarded over 35,000 to deserving Clark Atlanta University dual engineering students to date. Realizing the financial ca uh, challenges associated with furnishing a quality collegiate education, especially for those of color, alumni Lee, coupled with slutty vegan owner Pinky Cole, satisfied the fiscal balances of over 20 seniors so they can graduate from CAU in May of 2020. Alumna Lee was also instrumental in her sororities fundraising initiative, Sigma Alumni for CAU, and was one of the top fundraisers of the challenge that benefit, benefited CAU students. In all she touches professionally as a businesswoman, Lee remains committed to giving back. Co-founder of Hot Behavior LLC, a full-service marketing firm, alumna Lee's dedication to the, uh, to the uplift and development of women and students of color is apparent by her impactful execution of her events. Her client lists and events include PNG's My Black is Beautiful Tour and USCF's Empower Me Tour, which offered over $12 million in scholarships to students of color throughout the nation in 2019 to name a few. Proud co-owner of Harlem Hops, which you all have to go and check out if you're ever in Harlem. The most award-winning craft beer bar in Harlem, New York. Lee shares ownership with two other historically black college and university HBCU graduates, making it the first craft beer bar in New York City owned exclusively by African Americans. Lee is the founder of the Harlem Hop Scholarship Fund, a 501c3 that provides graduating Harlem High School seniors with scholarships to attend an HBCU. A Diamond Life member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated with 20 years plus later of membership remains near and dear to her heart. Lee continues to work of the um, organization's founders with her unwavering commitments to issues of importance to women. In 2017, Lee served on the national logistics team for the Women's March on Washington, D.C., honoring her commitment to young women in and entertainment industry. She serves as a board member of Women in Entertainment Empowerment Network, known as WEEN. She has also earned the Susan G. Coleman for the Cure Award for countless hours and resources donated to find a cure. Stacy also serves as the board chair of the Pinky Cole Foundation. Alumna Lee's awards and honors include, but are not limited to, the Selfridge Air Force Community Service Award, the Heroes of Breast Cancer Award, and recognition from the city of Sagnawa and Rochester Hills, among others for her passionate efforts to enhance communities, especially those of the underserved. In all she endeavors, Alumna Lee continues to live God's purpose for her life, lifting others as she continues to climb. Thank you so much, Alumna Lee, for definitely answering the call today and for joining your alma mater. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing? Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I am doing well, and thank you. Thank you. So we're going to go into your first question for today because I know we don't want to keep you all. You're very busy people, and you're doing amazing things, and we cannot be more proud of you. Flourishing C-suite executives build collaborative interdepartmental teams that achieve goals without vying for credit and praise. How do you inspire your cross-functional teams to meet their objectives while providing opportunities for individualized growth? Um, I think it's really important as a business owner um, to 
invest in your team to really understand what their goals are. And being an entrepreneur, um, I invest in my team, not just from a point of the work that they do for me, but I also want to understand what their goals are personally. Um, being an entrepreneur, I encourage my team members and those that work with me and those that work for me to start their own businesses if that's what they want to do. I encourage them to have multiple streams of income. When I go into meetings with my clients, the one thing that I always do is give my team praise. I talk about my team. I talk about the work that my team has done. I name them because there might be a point where I can't show up somewhere. For instance, last year at Essence Festival, I had, um, I had seven, activation, seven activations. I'm one person. I couldn't be everywhere, but the great thing was my clients knew who my team was. They knew who was over certain activations. They knew who were hiring the people. They knew by name who was helping with the marketing and advertisement. So that way they felt comfortable when I wasn't there. It's important that you train up your people to act for you when you're not able to actually be there. You know, a lot of times as um, someone was saying, I believe it was you, um, Judge Brown, talking about your people have to go out and represent you. They have to go out and communicate according to what it is that you want to be communicated. They have to represent your organization. They have to represent your group. They have to represent your company and do it in a manner as if you were there. So that, and so therefore you need to train your people accordingly and not be afraid that someone's going to take your job or take your position because see what God has for you is for you. No one can take from me my works. No one can take from me what it is that I put out into the universe because it always comes back to me. So I always want to make sure that my people, my staff, my management, that they are prepared for my clients in a manner as if I'm there presenting and executing because I execute with excellence. So that's my expectation in the people that I trained. Oh my gosh, girl, you said that important to train up. I'm train up. You better train them up. You can't come out here looking crazy oh, on, my, on my yeah. name. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? Out of all of the activations and events that I have seen you in, your team has been spot on. Thank so you. So you are doing an awesome job. That I mean, says a lot about them too. I, I couldn't do it without my team. Not ever. I always give them the praise. I always talk about my team. Latoria Lemon went to Clark Atlanta University. She is my left hand. She has executed and activated with me since I started my company. Um, you know, I've hired probably, I have no idea how many Clark Atlanta University graduates I've hired to work with me and graduates of other um, HBCUs. Yes, you have. And we are very, we're, look, we're watching. We're watching. <laughs> so who was your person that gave you that break? They believed in you when you had not yet earned such trust and from whom opportunities came that have helped create your success. And why are relationships like these important to maintain and remember when creating your C-suite legacy? I mean, relationships are everything. Um, you, know, your, you know, your environment and the people that you keep around you really show who you are and, and whose you are. Um, honestly, Valicia Butterfield Jones, who went to Clark Atlanta University, gave me my first break. She threw me in a room with Kevin Lyles and a whole bunch of other top-notch executives. And out of that, I earned a contract doing events for Carol's daughter because she knew my work. She knew, and I and and I and Valicia's my friend, but I still when approaching her and talking to her about business, I still left it as business. We could kiki later and be friends later, but when you're asking your friend or someone that you know to put their name on you, make sure that you approach them professionally. Um, you know, being friends isn't, isn't enough. So I, approach, I approached her professionally in a manner like, hey, you know, can you do these introductions? This is the work that I've done, you know, here's my portfolio, here's all of my information. So she had no problems with signing her name off on, hey, you know, take a look at this portfolio. This, I know this woman could do some great work for you. And it hasn't been just Valicia, it's been other Clark and Lynn University alumni, honestly. I mean, we come together, we support each other, we love on each other, and it's just so important 
if you tell me your net worth, I'll show you your net worth. Yes. Those two things go together. Your net worth is your net worth. And if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. If you're the richest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. You want to surround your, yourself with people that can help you grow. And the other thing that you really want to sit down and think about is your purpose over your passion, because they're two very totally different things. I can be passionate about so many things, but see, your purpose is what wakes you up in the morning. So you want to make sure that you find what your purpose is and you want to lie in and you want to be in it. Because when you're doing your purpose, the money will come. The money comes. It just comes. Are we going to add career coach to your, um, you know, resume? <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Cause you, you know, you just inspired my whole life. Like, you know, inspire me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, career, thank, you thank you. Career Stacy. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, if you all have any, any questions, which I know you all do for alumni, Lee, please type them into the Q&A box in the Zoom control panel now. We'll be sure to get to them during our Q&A session. Thank you so much, alumni. Lee. Thank you. So special thank yous to our panelists once again for the insightful gems that have been released today to go forth with you. We will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Just a reminder, please type them into your Q&A box in the Zoom control panel. Now is the perfect time to engage with your alums and to network. And you know, alumni Lee could not have said it better along with our other alumni. Excellence is key and your network is your network. So let's get it on. It looks like we have a few questions. Let's see, let's see. Uh, let me see if, is Dr. Rhodes, are you still on? Because um, I know you did have to leave. Um, it looks like alumna had, um, alumna Dr. Rhodes had to step off. This is from Andrea Bradford. What we'll do is we'll make sure that she answers it for you and get it back to you if that is okay, um, Andrea Bradford. The next question is for alumnus Butler. This is also from alumna Andrea Bradford. She said, with the stock market on an upswing, what is your recommendation with regard to investing? Yes, most say you should, but after you have paid off all of your debt and saved a six to eight month emergency fund, but doesn't it make sense to take some money and put in the stock market, particularly for those who do not have a 401k? Stocks are mutual funds, something that would have gained more over the long haul. Uh, great question. Um, the answer depends on the goals that the investor has. Um, if you are if, if you are looking for short term results, um, stock market may not be the best scenario. Uh, we're in a very volatile environment right now. Um, you know, the next two quarters are going to be really, really crucial to determine if we're going to enter some type of recession. Um, but on the but on that note as well, um, if you're looking for a long term solution, right? So this is something that I consider five years or more as it pertains to investing. Yes, I think the stock market um, will be a, a valuable play because when you look at any ten year span in the stock market, it has never lost money. That is through every depression, every every recession. Every boom, stock market has never lost money in, in any 10 year span that you look at. So it really all depends on your on your goals and your time, your time horizons. If you have time to uh, invest and you want to just, you know, gradually grow um, your investments and in, in, like really make a smart money decision, uh, feel free to reach out to me and uh, we can kind of craft craft the uh, plan for you. Awesome. And alums, if you all do not mind, can you all um, place your social handles or handle in the uh, chat so our alums can definitely reach out to you and be able to contact you? Um, alumna Brown and Alumna Lee, do you all have any closing remarks that you all would like to say? Well, I just want to say that I am privileged to be in this space, in this place with these amazing <laughs> alumni. I feel like I have been enriched. Um, I sort of forgot that we had people watching because I was so engrossed in what <laughs> they were saying. And so I just want to thank them for 
um, being in this space, in this place, in this, and in, in being present in this moment and know that you're not just inspiring future Clark alumni or present Clark alumni, you're inspiring all of us. And so just continue to do the great work. And I am proud, so proud to um, wear the Clark Atlanta, um, I'm, just, I'm gonna say crown um, with you all. So I just wanna thank them if, if I can for just being so amazing, so authentic and so transparent for today. I love the lead. Do you have any closing remarks? Uh, you know, I too have been listening. I've been taking notes. I've been learning, um, you know, with everyone that's listening, just, you know, be inspired and, and really walk in your purpose and really understand, you know, what your purpose is. Cause I'm telling you each and every day, it, it's hard. It, it's tough right now. You know, no one's negating that, but the one thing that you can do to bring you some type of peace of mind is truly understand what your purpose driven life is. Amen to that. Amen. Um, alumnus Butler, uh, I will send this, this, this one uh, question is also from alumnus Mario Butler, but I will send this to you since we are almost out of time. Um, and I want to be respectful of everyone's time. So alumnus Butler, we will make sure that your question is answered and get back to you. Okay. Um, thank you all again to our alumni uh, panelists for the insightful gems. And thank you all for tuning in today. If you all would like to um, join us next Thursday at noon, we will also have a special treat for our homecoming uh, webinar. And part three of this webinar will take place at the end of the month on um, from noon until So please be sure to join us for both of these upcoming webinars. You do not want to miss them. Great. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. Special thanks to our colleagues, Senior Director of Alumni Relations, Mrs. Gaylani Gatewood Joshua, and Dr. Rose for their stellar service. And once again, to our panelists for our remarkable job today. Thank you again, everyone. If you're following us on social media, please follow us on um, well, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram at CAU Alumni Relations for more updates, events, and celebrations. Talk soon. Thank you, alumni office. Appreciate y'all. Thank, Thank you. you.